know what uh, it cracks me up if, if, if you notice? Every week when I walk up here, Nick takes this and moves it back here. And I have to crack it and bring it back up. Gotta love communication. <laughs> oh, I know you, I know you did. <laughs> <laughs> alright, alright. Tomorrow's gonna be great. <laughs> uh, I want to welcome you. If you're new, we are, we are glad you are here. I want to start off this morning, if you will, uh, having a little participation. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a description of a particular individual, and, and I want to know if you know who that individual is. Now, if you do, don't shout out the answer because the person next to you doesn't, and you want to hold that answer right to the very end so you can say it, and no, they didn't know it, and then you're on top. So, let me describe somebody for you and see if you can figure out who this person is. Now, if you were to turn on your TV oh, set... Moses? <laughs> Alright, go to slide number two. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That was awesome. <laughs> if you were to turn on your TV set, and there before you is this servant. She is smiling, laughing, joking with those that she serves. One needs a shirt iron, one needs help with homework, one needs some advice. And on and on it goes until this servant just smiles her way through it. She's wearing a blue dress and a white apron, carrying a large casserole dish as she enters the dining room where the large family sits on a long dining room table. A man and a woman sit opposite ends of the table, and with them, three boys on one side and three girls on the other. Who is that servant? Alice. Alice. That's right. <laughs> Alice from the Brady Bunch. All right, let's try this one next. This servant is musically gifted, and no, it's not Nick. And is never seen smiling, so maybe it is. Uh, but the son... <laughs> but the servant uh, that or the service that this servant provides is impeccable. The living area has the finest antique furniture ever. Candles flicker throughout the room, a hyperactive black-haired man and his rather gothic-looking wife talk with their children, who happen to be on the floor playing with a tarantula. Even a stranger sights uh, are, are uh, even stranger sights are yet to appear. In comes a bald man, so pale he almost looks blue. Then the husband of the manor calls for our servant by pulling a long rope dangling from a space out of nowhere, and in walks this monstrous living corpse with the answer you rang. Who is this person? Lurch. Lurch. What did I, I heard a wrong answer? Who, who said that? <laughs> that was awesome. How about this? The next, this is our next uh, servant. He provides uh, this service only to one. He's not aware, of, or he's uh, not only aware of all the family secrets, but he also is a very important ally. This is a clue. This servant serves a man staring at the fireplace when all of a sudden his eyes are turned to the window. Outside, it's very dark, and yet the entire sky is lit up like a beacon. The man jumps from his seat and runs to the secret passageway and into the cave, and he is met halfway down by an elderly man reminding him that villains in the night can do more damage than our Cape Crusader may have considered. Who is this servant? Alfred. Alfred, Alfred that's right. <laughs> Let's try this one. Uh, this might be a struggle for some of you. Our next servant serves the Bel Air Mansion. Should I go any further? <laughs> Oh, well, let's try this. A husband and his wife had three of their own, and yet they graciously take on a nephew. They do their best to keep him from making unwise decisions, but he continues to go through life. And in walks this short man with a black tuxedo with tails, a white shirt, and a black bow tie and white gloves. He makes smart remarks before being sent to another room. Who is this servant? Jeffrey. Jeffrey or Jeffrey <laughs> from Fresh Prince. Let's give you this one. In walks our next servant. With a large plate of bacon and eggs. If you're over the age of 30, let, let, hold your answer on this one. I want to see if anybody under 30 can get this. And, and, and worship team, no helping. You know the answer to this. All right. This servant is sporting a long braided ponytail. There is another big table where a man sits at the head with his three sons as they discuss chores, chores for the day. They're all wearing vests and gun holsters. Who is this servant? <laughs> Show the picture. Maybe this will help. Who is this servant? <laughs> this is hop scene from Bonanza. Come on. And 
If you were born after the year 2000 and you get this next one right, kudos to you. This servant keeps cleaning up around the home of the future. She is depicted as wearing a filthy apron or a frilly apron and is often seen using a vacuum cleaner. She too wears a blue dress. She rolls around on her set of caster wheels. She is a humanoid robot housekeeper. She serves George, Jane, Judy, and Elroy. She has the most trouble, though, caring for Astro. She says things like, you betcha, Mr. J. Who is this, yeah. sir? Rosie! Rosie from the Jessens, that's right. We are, like Nick said, we're, we're in a series talking about why church. Answering the question of why church? Why does the church exist? Why do we meet? Why do we get together? What is our purpose? And, and, and so far, we've, we've spent a couple of weeks doing this, answering this question. The, the first week diving into this series, we talked about how, uh, how the church exists so that we may encounter a greater love. That you and I are the bride, that we are the bride, and Jesus is the groom, and the groom has a heartthrob for his bride. And so as a church, we exist to bring people to Christ. We exist to show them Christ. Last week we dove into the question of why church, and we talked about how the church or why the church exists, so that we can embrace a greater truth, that the Bible is God's word, that it is his voice to us. And so we talked about this being the greater truth, and that the truth has a heartbeat, and his name is Jesus Christ. We, one of the things that's interesting about Jesus Completely different from every other spiritual teacher, every other truth teacher, anybody out there who, who examines and points to some truth, is that Jesus doesn't point outward to a truth, but yet when we look at it, Jesus points to himself. All of Jesus' teachings about truth were about himself. Today, you probably picked it up, we're talking about the topic of service. So why church? It has to do with service. Now before you... Now, before we dive in, I want to say this. It's going to be very easy for you to walk out of here smiling with a positive attitude going, I am so glad I'm part of a church that serves. I'm so glad that I'm part of a church that likes to serve well. But I don't think, I want you know, I don't think this is the point of what we're about to look at. I think the thrust of what God's desire for you and I is this morning is that we're going to understand that each and every one of us are to be the servant. We're called to be servants. Would you follow along with me? Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, Paul writes this to the church. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. Because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus says this, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. The title of this message and the answer to the question, Why church? So that we can engage in a greater service. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, as we dive into your word this morning and talk about the topic of service, Father, may we... Not walk out of here going, man, the church does a great job. But Father, may we see that you call each and every one of us to be the servant. To partake in service and to serve others as if we were serving you. Father, speak to our hearts. And may your Holy Spirit direct us in this now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's something that we all have in common this morning, whether you're new here, or been here a long time, whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian. We all have a, a number of things in common, but one in particular we all have in common is this. We all have an attitude. Now, husbands, do not look at your wife, all right? I know there's the temptation, like, don't do it, just trust me, it's going to go well for you if you don't. But all of us have an attitude. And let me, let me explain real quick what I mean by attitude. All of us have this manner, this disposition, this feeling or position in regards to a person or thing. In fact, if you were to look up kind of a definition or a summary of what an attitude is, it's the, it's the way a person views something or tends to act or behave towards it. And here's the thing, all of us have attitudes. But your attitude is distinctly yours. Your attitude is not my attitude. Your attitude is your attitude, and only you can change your attitude. 
We can have the exact same situation, exact same scenario, exact same thing in front of us, but each of us can have a different attitude towards that person or towards that concept or towards that thing. Let me give you an example of that using the animal kingdom. Take dogs and cats, for example. Both of them can have the same experience but have different attitudes. For example, a dog can look at its owner, look at you know the, the, the person who owns it, says, "You feed me, you clean me, you you uh, you pet me, you you shelter me, uh, you play with me. You must be God." And then a cat will see the exact same thing, go, "You feed me, you shelter me, you pet me, you play with me, you pick up after me. I must be God." <laughs> your attitude is your attitude, and only you. And change it. As Christians, though, and I'm speaking to Christians in the room, as Christians, Christ calls us to have his attitude, to have the attitude of Jesus. Now, you know what's interesting is in the New Testament, we don't find a Greek word for attitude. Instead, what the writers tend to use is they use one of two words. They use this Greek word phroneo, or they use this Greek word called enoia. Now, phroneo is, is referring to the mind. It's referring to this thinking or feeling, the way you think towards something, the way to, you feel towards something. We see in passages like Romans 15, where Paul writes, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind. The way you think, the way you feel towards, here's the key, towards each other that Christ Jesus had. So that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul also uses this word to the Colossian church in chapter 3, verse 2. He says, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Dividing souls and spirits, joint and marrow, it judges the what? The thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. We see it again in 1 Peter, where Peter writes, Therefore, since Christ suffered with his body, arm yourselves with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. This word attitude is not just thinking, but it's kind of almost like our purpose, having the same mind as Christ, but also having the same purpose of Christ. So here's the point. You and I, as Christians, are called to have the same attitude the same purpose, the same mindset as Jesus. Paul puts it this way to the Ephesians church. In Ephesians chapter 4, he says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its evil desires or by its deceitful desires, and to be made new, check this, in the attitude of your minds, and to put, off the, or put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness, and holiness. We're to have the same mind, that same attitude as Jesus. One of my favorite sayings is save people, serve people. And that's so true. Christians who are saved people are called to serve people. We're called to be a servant to them. Jesus ultimately served us and now we're to go and to serve other people. And I love the fact that we're called to do that, but we're not just called to serve for no reason. No, when we, we are saved to serve because our hope is that served people will one day become saved people. If you're new here or you're not a Christian, I want you to know everything we do here, every act of service we do is out of our desire for you to know Jesus Christ. It's not so we feel better about ourselves. We don't teach scripture so we feel good about ourselves. We teach scripture because we want you to fall in love with Jesus. We don't pray to make ourselves feel better. We pray so that you also would come alongside of us in falling in love with Jesus. We serve people because we desire for them to become saved people. Everything we do is done with that attitude in mind. And I want you to know, it's not just a few people in the church that have this attitude. All of us here as, as members and all of us uh, who are Christians, we, we are doing this, like I said, because we want you to have a relationship with Christ. You know, one of the things that constantly, over and over again, amazes me about West K is the amount of people we have here that serve routinely. Not just once or twice, but serve over and over and over again who are involved in serving Last year, a church consulting firm 
put out a number of uh, statistics and information about churches, and, and one of them was a, a comparison between church attendance and church service. And I, I, they took a picture of what they put up on a drawing board. I got that here for you, but I want to kind of note some things in this. They put out there that the average church, the average church engages roughly four to five people out of ten. So 40 to 50 percent of average churches have those people serving at least once a month. Sometimes more, but it's just a once a month or more basis. The above average church, they noted, has somewhere between six to seven out of ten people serving once a month. Earlier this year, I had our ladies in the office, as well as last year, uh, looking at how many people that we have going here compared to how many people we have here that serve. And consistently, over the past few years, 70 to 80% of our people that attend here, not our members, but 70% to 80% of our people that attend here serve in one way or another. I love that. I love that. And as a church, we love that. We love getting people connected here, serving <laughs> other people. Because our ultimate purpose is that saved people serve people so that served people would one day become saved people. See, our service to you is rooted in our desire for you to come to know Jesus Christ and to know him more. So, why church? Because the church is called to engage in a greater service. You ever wonder why uh, when, when the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and asks him, what must I do to get to heaven? Like, what do I got to do to be saved, Jesus? And he replies to him. He says, well, follow the commandments. Follow the commandments. He says, yeah, I, I've done that. So I, I, I've loved God. I, I, I've, I've loved the Lord. I've loved him all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. But yet then Jesus tends to he, he tacks something on at the end of that. He says, and love your neighbor as yourself. See, here, here's the thing. Jesus knows that when we put it out there, you need to love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. That's an inward thing. And, and I can fake that. I can say, yeah, I love Jesus. Yeah, I love God. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm going to follow the commandments. Awesome. I can do that mentally. And I can fool you on that. But I can't fool you on how I'm called to love other people. See, my actions through my service display what I truly think and truly feel. See, you can say one thing, but your actions are going to speak louder than words. Do you remember the movie Groundhog's Day with Bill Murray? I love that movie. The premise of the movie is you got, you got Phil, and he goes to uh, Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania for Groundhog's Day on February 2nd. And, and he goes there, and, and then he goes to bed that night after Groundhog's Day. And he wakes up to what would be February 3rd, but then he realizes it's Groundhog's Day again. And over and over and over again, he relives the same day, one after the other. And, and at first, he takes advantage of it. Like, if, 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 if I could do this, then I could do whatever I want. And he goes crazy. I love the scene where he's just stuffing his face with donuts and, and coffee and just going crazy. Like, that's like every man's dream there, right? You know, sitting in a diner with a pretty woman shoving stuff in your face. It's, it's a beautiful thing. But as he goes on, he starts to lose hope. He starts to lose his excitement about the day. In fact, it becomes this kind of this, this, this negative thing for him. He's now in turmoil and he's, he starts to disobey the law and just does whatever he can. Eventually, he starts trying to commit suicide. But every day... He wakes up February 2nd. And the cycle goes over and over and over again until he starts to develop within himself this desire to help others. I want to show you a video clip. This is probably one of my favorite spots or, or, or uh, clips of, uh, uh, of Groundhog Day. Check this out with me. Let me tell you why I love that clip. 
you catch what he said at the end? I had the tire, I had the jack, it'll only be a minute. Now, he's done this day after day after day serving people. But check this, he uses what he has. He doesn't do something what he doesn't have. I want to let you know, Christ calls Christians to serve people, but he doesn't call you to serve them with what you don't have. He calls you to serve them simply with what you have. See, it's not until after Phil begins to serve people that his days become enjoyable. The point of the movie is simply to remind us of the power of serving someone else. That it's good for us, too. That's exactly how God has wired you and I. God has wired us to serve. Paul put it this way in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. For you were called to freedom. Not only, not only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity to, for, the, for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Peter said it this way, each one of you should use whatever gifts that he has received to serve others. Serving people with what you have. Paul put it this way to the, um, to the Philippian church in chapter 2. He says, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, in any, effect, or any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind. Have this mind. Among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. You pick that up. Have the same attitude of mind as Jesus Christ. Who, though he was in the form of God, he did not count himself equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form.